Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, we're going to be speaking in this segment on transradial carotid stenting. I have no disclosures to make. So as Bill had uh, very eloquently stated, carotid artery stenting with embolic protection has been shown to be in the most part equivalent to carotid endarterectomy. The transfemoral approach remains still the standard access site for carotid stenting. However, there are several alternatives, such as transradial, transbrachial, or direct carotid uh, puncture. So why do we do radial access? Well, using the transfemoral approach in certain complex uh, arch anatomy remains one of the main reasons for technical failure for increased incidence of IPSI and contralateral um, uh, strokes. And as you see on this slide, the uh, femoral artery is a very easy access. It's the one that we've most been trained to access for coronary interventions and for peripheral interventions as well. It's a larger artery. However, uh, high sticks are associated with uh, um, retroperitoneal hematoma. Slower sticks are associated with uh, fistulas and pseudoaneurysms. And as you can imagine, if I'm dragging a catheter up the uh, thoracic aorta in a severely atherosclerotic uh, a disease uh, aorta, there's potential uh, emboli that could result in strokes, particularly when the aorta is heavily calcified, as you see in this, uh, this image. The other problem is complex uh, aortic uh, arch anatomy. Um, Imagine trying to get a catheter through this angulated uh, aortic arch. And what we do is that uh, we classify this arches into type one, type two, and type three based on the uh, origin of the brachiocephalic trunk in relationship with the aortic arch. So if we draw an imaginary line over the outer curvature of the aortic arch and another horizontal imaginary line over the inner uh, curvature of the aortic arch. When the brachiocephalic origin occurs above this horizontal line, it's a type one arch. If it occurs between these two uh, imaginary lines, which you don't see the one on the bottom, it's a type two arch. And when it originates below the lower or the uh, inner imaginary line, it's a type three arch. So it's very difficult to maneuver catheters up into the carotids. The other form of complex aortic arch is what we call a bovine arch, and it comes in two varieties. One, when the um, left carotid originates from a common origin with a brachiocephalic or a nominate artery, and the other one is a branch of the nominate artery. So transradial carotid uh, axis actually uh, has been described since the early 1990s as a successful and, sta and safe approach for patients with uh, complex arch anatomy. Has been described for contralateral radial access for carotid stenting with high technical and a low uh, complication rate. And it's using complex arch anatomy, which can potentially minimize catheter manipulation in the aortic arch and uh, obviously decrease the risk of uh, embolic strokes. So in this multi-center prospective randomized trial of uh, 260 patients who were considered high risk for carotid endarterectomy and were going to undergo carotid stenting, they were randomized into radial axis versus transfemoral axis. And there was no difference in major adverse uh, cardiac and cerebrovascular events. There was no difference in procedure time and fluoroscopy time. And there was a lower uh, hospitalization uh, time. So radial axis is uh, quite simple. We're using it more frequently in the cardiac catheterizations laboratory, particularly for coronary interventions. Do local anesthetic over the, uh, the um, radial artery. We use micropuncture to access the radial. We uh, anticoagulate with unfractionated heparin. We give vasodilators, and we proceed with the radial angiography. And then we engage the carotids. Now, this may be a little cumbersome. You've got to be a little experienced with a reverse curve catheters, which are the best ones to uh, engage the carotids. That is Simmons 2, Simmons 3. For bovine arches, we prefer using uh, VTEC catheters, unless you feel more comfortable with others. 
The right Quran is that uh, it is uh, uh, frequently engaged with a Simmons two, a Simmons three as well. And there's various techniques for advancing the sheath and uh, guide delivery. We have the telescoping technique, the anchoring technique, or the catheter looping and retrograde engagement. And I'll show you these. The telescoping technique is a simple one. We uh, advance a catheter and a steerable wire into the external uh, carotid. We advance our catheter into the external carotid, and then we telescope or we sheath the diagnostic catheter up to the distal common carotid. The anchoring is uh, perhaps the simplest one of all. We advance a uh, steerable wire and a uh, diagnostic catheter into the external carotid. We then exchange the uh, steerable wire for a stiff wire, such as an amplex wire. And then we uh, proceed to, advance, to exchange and uh, advance a, uh, a sheath. And the cathode looping and uh, retrograde engagement technique is one in which we advance a wire into the ascending uh, thoracic aorta. We advance it into the uh, aortic valve. It loops, and then it goes up. And then you follow or, uh, the, uh, the wire uh, by advancing your catheter over it. So let me show you a couple cases. The first one's gonna be a right radial artery carotid stenting of the uh, right internal carotid and then asymptomatic high risk patient. You see here the uh, left carotid is completely occluded. The right has a uh, very severe uh, proximal or osseal lesion. We advance a uh, steerable wire and a catheter into the external carotid. We exchange the uh, steerable wire for a stiff wire, such as an amplex or a stork wire, whatever you prefer using. We then advance a, uh, a sheath, in this case was a true destination sheath, up to the distal common carotid. We then advance a, a wire and a filter, distal protection uh, device, as we usually do. And then the stent is deployed, as you see there. So this is the previous uh, uh, film and the post-procedure angiography. The next two cases that I'm gonna be presenting uh, were borrowed. Uh, the reason for that is that the first one that I'm going to be presenting uses double protection, which we don't have available, and the second one I haven't had the nerve to do yet, and you will see why. In this case, we have a very severe left internal carotid artery stenosis, which was intervened the usual way. We advance our sheath, we advance a uh, distal protection, uh, embolic protection device. We uh, balloon and we stent. The stent is placed, and then there is a post dilatation of that stent utilizing a double protection. As you see, we have our distal uh, NAV6 embolic protection device. We have this paladin balloon, which has another uh, filter here, and then you have the balloon being inflated inside the stent. As you know, most embolic events occur with the post dilatation of, of the stent. This is how it looks. The next one is a case uh, that I borrowed from a colleague from Scopia. This is a right radial carotid stenting of a left internal carotid utilizing a proximal protection device. So this is a robust right radial artery that uh, is available for this case. I still haven't found one as robust as this. Simmons 2 catheter is advanced into the left internal carotid artery, a wire is advanced into the left external, a MoMA proximal protection device is then advanced. As you see here, you have the uh, proximal balloon inflation, you have your distal balloon inflation in the external carotid. There's no anti-grade flow except what we're injecting through the catheter. So the debris that was retracted this is the final result.
So transrater carotid stenting is an attractive alternative approach, especially in patients who have extensive uh, PAD, patient with complex, uh, carot uh, complex aortic arch anatomy. Safety, success, and feasibility has already been demonstrated, as uh, Dr. Gray has uh, eloquently uh, mentioned. With experienced operators, major adverse uh, cardiac and cerebrovascular events are low and comparable with a transfemoral approach. Limitations still remain with the sheath size and guide size, and in selective cases, the use of proximal protection device using a very large bore sheath is possible. Thank you.